Hello and welcome to the next episode of The Podcast, a cannabis podcast for budding enthusiasts. As always, you're joined here by your boy, Heavy Days, here from the Upside Down Library. And as usual, we want to give a massive shout out to our incredible sponsors who helped make the show happen. Seeds here now, your number one seed bank in the industry. A guarantee on satisfaction, not just germination, with all the hottest breeders and the latest drops. Why would you go anywhere else? If you finish a grow and you're not satisfied with the end product, hit them up. They'll make it right. They only stock the highest quality breeders. And I know they got some fire packs from your boy Heavy Days there. Check them out before they're gone, guys. Massive shout out to Seeds here now, your number one stop for all your genetic needs. But in order to get your garden pumping on all cylinders and producing the best crop to date, you got to make sure your room's dialed in. To do that, check out our friends at Pulse Sensors, number one sensors and integrated hubs in the game, measuring all of the variables, PPD, VPD, temperature, humidity, dew point, all the extra variables you don't consciously track to help ensure your next crop is the best to date. Whether you're running a single tent, a single room, or a multi-state operation, Pulse Sensors are the number one in the game, and they've just recently released the Pulse Hub, a central unit to integrate all of their monitors to make sure that your rooms are the best they can possibly be. Massive thank you to Pulse Sensors. We appreciate you so much. Likewise, you've got to keep your garden pest and pathogen free, and to do that, you've got to check out our friends at Copit. These guys are the world leaders in sustainable biocontrol solutions for pests and disease. If you're battling spider mites, check out their new Spidex Vital Plus sachets. These are new Persimilis breeding sachets that release predator mites into your crop consistently over a period of several weeks, providing you with sustained spider mite control. Now you don't have to spread carrier material through your garden just to introduce predator mites. Just hang the sachets on your crop, let the Persimilis walk out and do the work for you. Trust me guys, you don't want to have to go up against a spider mite infestation without Spidex Vital Plus. These are truly the best predators in the game. I promise once you use it, you'll see the quality, you'll never go back. Massive shout out to Copet. Likewise, you got to check out our friends at Organics Alive. If you're growing organic and want to use high quality powdered organic fertilizers, you simply cannot go past Organics Alive. These guys truly walk the walk and talk the talk. They have been picking up cups left, right and centre with growers all around the country sweeping categories using their products. That is the ultimate testament in my opinion if home growers are winning competitions using their products. The proof is in the pudding guys. No matter what stage of the plant cycle you're at, veg, transition, flower, in need of micronutrients or a very specific sort of boost in late flower, they've got it. You've got to check out Organics Alive, guys. Truly one of the best in the industry. We're super stoked to be working with them because we know how amazing their products are. Used in heaps of breeder gardens that we have on the show. Again, check them out. Organics Alive. Massive thank you. Massive shout out for supporting the show. Finally, a massive shout out to the entire crew at Dynavap. These guys make some of the best vaporizers on the game. I'm really passionate about this one because they help me to get off combustion and smoking bongs. If you have any concerns about your respiratory health, or heck, if you just want to try a different mode of ingestion, maybe try to get a better flavor hit, you've got to check out the Dynavat. These guys' units are cheap, they're incredibly well designed, and most importantly, they're very customizable. You can take your vape game to the next level, getting insane terps, all while retaining the potency you'd expect of a combustion or a bong. Truly, I was smoking bongs for over 10 years. I'm now vape only. Massive shout out to Dynavap. They're one of the best in the industry and we owe them a massive thank you. Shout out again, Dynavap. Massive thanks for supporting the show. Finally, a quick little mention to our Patreon gang, truly the lifeblood of the show. If you want to get early access to episodes, unheard and unreleased interviews, as well as going in the running to get amazing genetics each month and fortnight, come on, check out the Patreon at www.patreon.com forward slash the podcast. We do live smoke with heavy sessions every fortnight and give away heaps of swag every month. Come check it out. We love you, the Patreon gang. Thank you so much. We are so appreciative. On today's episode, we have none other than head honcho behind Mr. Nice Seeds, old school legend, one of the last pillars of modern genetics, a massive shout out to the man behind countless strains, Shanti Baba, here to talk all things breeding. 
history, plans for the future, and so much more. Without further delay, let's get into it. Alrighty gang, we're back for another episode and on today, a massive welcome to one of the absolute titans in the cannabis industry, one of the last remaining godfathers of modern genetics, the breeder behind countless strains and organizations, a big, big welcome to Shanti Barber of Mr. Nice. Thank you very much. It sounds like a pretty epic introduction. Not sure if I'm worthy of it, but yeah, thank you very much. Nice to be here. Oh, I had to put some respect on it. There was there was no doubt on that. Uh, my first question is, what have you been smoking on recently? <laughs> uh, I mix it up a lot. Um, I'm uh, I make a lot of hashes myself, and um, I kind of um, we've always made ice and we've made dry sieve and, and blended them together. It's kind of the old old school part of me. Um, when I tell people I use. You grow all this biomass just to make a few grams of hash. Uh, they laugh, but actually, it's the truth. So I laugh in the end. Yeah, but uh, actually, uh, mainly, mainly hashes, but specific from like super silver haze or mango haze. So we we grow a bunch. I do a little dry sip, and then we try it out like that, and it's always um, enjoyable. I must say, you know. Oh, beautiful. Look, I think concentrates are definitely a growing part of the market and our listeners would love to hear, what of your varieties do you feel work particularly well for making concentrates? Oof. Well, I mean, there, there's definitely varieties. First of all, um, if you're going to make a, a sieved hash, uh, like a dry sieve, like Morocco or something like that, uh, I, I do go for... Um, outdoor plants because outdoor plants make much better uh, they've got better uh, resin glands for um, when when you excite them and you make the hash usually doesn't get milky when you break it up like indoor uh, resin uh, pollen yeah, and it kind of um, <clears throat> it becomes a, like a solid hash and I must add that about 80% of the market used to be hashish in Europe before the, the green revolution sort of thing so and that's just the, since the 90, uh, late 80s, early 90s, when Northern Green started to change that ratio around. But um, no, I, I am in different days. I love um, certain varieties of marijuana. Um, but but Nordal is a great strain to make hash from, the, the shit or the skunk one. Mango haze, outstanding if you're really going for these flavours. I mean, that's pretty hard to pass up. And of course, um, if you're again, the Neville Hayes is, uh, uh, and it's, it's like the champagnes of, of hashes for me. So, you know, um, but because I had so much years of experience, I, I kind of, I'm lucky enough to be able to have these plants and create those things and not share them. <laughs> we, <laughs> sorry, but uh, uh, they make so much of them. They're not commercial products all the time. Yeah, look, you, you nailed it on the head. I, I'm sure you've tried some things I can only dream of. And so I, I wanted to ask, you know, especially given that you had, you know, you, you had the tight friendship with the original Mr. Nice himself, Howard, I would love to ask, what's the most memorable hash you've ever had? Well, I remember a distinct story. Um, uh, I was getting busted by the police. They were searching my house around 2003. <laughs> And there was a piece of hash that I had made um, and won the cu cannabis cup with in, I think it was 90, number 19, 97, 98, with Shanti Baba hash. It was a hash that I really did. A, a, there was no no movement. It was just a dry sieve while we were cleaning this particular um, line of um, of um, skunks that I'd got from Rob Clark. And, and I did it, must have been about 50 or 60 kilos over the silk screens and we made maybe 800 grams in total and i i, I sold that to arian and he entered it as shanti baba hash in 98 i think we won the cup with that but i kept a small piece and 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 whenever howard and i got together we would smoke this one because it was outstanding it was even neville loved it i mean neville and i pressed it on the floor upstairs above the the coffee shop years ago uh, in 98 and he said, wow, this is like, that was amazing pollen. And uh, so um, when I was getting, uh, I had some unfortunate problem in, in at one stage in 2003 and the police were searching the house and they, 
The policeman picked up this small remaining piece of hash, the Shanti Baba hash that I had, and it was about 2003, so four, four or five years after we'd won the cup wins. And I only kept that for Neville. And I looked at him and I said, please, you can do whatever you want. Just that one's something special. If you can leave it there, I'd appreciate it. And I don't know. It was just one of those amazing moments. Still makes my hair stand up. But the policeman put it down. There was about six Catavignetti going through the house, searching. And this guy, I'll never forget him, he put it back and left it there. And when I got out from all the issue, I had that hash. It was the only thing left. And I rang up Howard and I told him, fly over, mate. We have some work to do. And uh, <laughs> basically that that was a, a really, uh, yeah, it was very sad when that finished. But every good thing comes to an end, unfortunately. Wow, that that is an absolutely brilliant story. I love that. You knew what had to yeah. be done. <laughs> Out of curiosity, was that um was that in Australia or in like Switzerland? No, no, that that was in Switzerland in, in Switzerland in two thousand and three. But but the hash I'd made in ninety seven ninety eight with Neville, um, uh, and I'd been collecting it for probably a year. So I mean, you really make very small amounts if you do very like one percent of whatever you're doing. Or some people overdo the spins and they start getting it green. I just like it where it's grey and white and uh, tasty. And uh, then we then we normally once we finish the dry stuff, we put it in the the water and we make the ice and then we blend them together in ratios to find a good hash. So it's uh, because the what ice is is very strong. It's almost clinical. You know what I mean. So and the dry is flavoursome and aromatic so when you put them together you've still got the same resins but they're slightly different one's cleaner than the other and the other's got turpins and one doesn't so you blend them together you make a fantastic uh, you know piece of hash i suggest that to all your viewers <laughs> wow yeah look the the art of blending is so relatively unexplored in the industry i think and you you just probably outlaid more knowledge on it than what i've ever really heard i guess i'll just follow that up do you do you like just trial and error with the blending, or is it like you're trying to blend terpenes? It, you know, and it all began when um, we were in the say the early nineties when I first came to Amsterdam. We used to try to kind of um, replicate a, a, a breed by having a pure haze and a pure indica and, and sort of seventy five twenty five or fifty fifty or and try to see how they. They came up, so skunk or northern light, pure or the hazes. You could put 25, 25, 50 percent together and you smoke that joint and you kind of have an idea of what a breed may generally be, you know, sort of be, be showing, manifesting, and, and that would be a way. So the hash for me was an extension of that because it's like um, winemaking nowadays. I, I really, I'm right into um, red wine, especially from. Uh, you know, I know quite a fair bit about um, Italian wines, and and so I and and Spanish wines, and I I um I really think that the blending of pure strains in different proportions, um, you can really make new new world wines, and that's a good winemaker. It's like everyone can have the same tools, but they don't do the same job. You know, certain people have an understanding that goes way and beyond other people's understanding when they're looking at the same thing. So. I've never really been worried about people copying. I mean, they try their best, but uh, and they do. Some people do better jobs than me at growing flowers, for sure. But uh, you know, when it comes to breeding, I think it's uh, we we worked it out how to do that over the last 40, 50 years. Have been doing it for a while, so you know. Oh wow, we're going to have to talk about some Italian wines another day. <laughs> uh, I'm passionate like yourself, but you've just uh, got me curious. Have you ever had any strains that were born from that um, sort of you know remix process as you mentioned, like where you mix them and you were like, you know what, let's do it, and then it went on to make something well, legendary? Yeah, m most of the early stuff in the early '90s when I used to sit around with Neville and in his place down in the south of Holland, and we would we would blend up different fewer things that we were working on and try to – and a lot of – I mean, it sounds a, a bit of a goofy way to do things, but actually it's it's quite um, a, a good resource when, when you're trying to uh, um, imagine a, a sense 
You know what I mean? To to imagine a smell and a flavor is very difficult. You can imagine a, a picture or something, but flavors and that it's a very difficult uh, concept. And so when you put a, a kind of a practical thing there and you could roughly taste something that was in those proportions and you know maybe um slightly different hazes and slightly different skunks gave a different thing so you could tweak them a little bit we were lucky enough to be growing so many different things and different uh, versions of the same seeds we could play with sisters and um a lot of a lot of love and time went into it it was very it's creative process which most people might not kind of understand but um it's it's uh, it's like a fourth dimension breeding you know you have to visualize different parallel things that are very hard to put your finger on and, and words to most of the time so you know we come to it ourselves and everyone has a feeling as well so that that hopefully if you've got a bit of intuition about things or you use them a lot and you know what you're talking about which neville and i did um we both sort of came to we, we self-policed ourselves we didn't bullshit you know if it didn't work it didn't work and you know but when it worked a little bit you thought mm, and you follow that down the line a little bit and create a few strains <laughs> so <laughs> oh i think you're underselling it with a few but uh that that's really legendary to hear I, i'm so stoked to hear that because i've heard some people talk about blending flour but i think you're you're right hash should be the next level up so the question I, that comes to mind is, is is this largely speaking how you approach breeding these days or is it more of like a paper, you know, you write things down and just see what works? I have um, my can of Bible and I write notes about everything because a lot of seed uh, um, um, sort of packages I have in the fridge are from different um, sort of stages of the breeding. So I can go back to... A second stage and continue it on to the fifth stage if i've got time or so i've got a lot of projects like first second third fourth fifth stage in the fridge all the time uh the thing is that um you know th i don't think there's a lot of breeding going on so much anymore uh, unfortunately uh maybe this tissue culture is going to save it and maybe you know sort of um, laboratory kind of um catalyzed breeding will will happen with with dna reconstitutions and stuff but old you know selective natural selection breeding which is something that i still think is um it has much more merit because it's both theory and practical in a in an area um uh, you know uh, without chemicals and spraying male uh, females to make them male and do all of that which is that this new sort of fast food culture um for me it used to take two years to make a breed or longer, four or five years, you know, and, and people want something new every week nowadays. So, I mean, uh, they're just spraying uh, gelato to Girl Scout cookie to wedding cake. And I don't even know what these parents are anymore. So I don't even know what they, when they talk about these names, I, I have no idea what we're talking about. Is it a skunk? Is it a kush? Is it skunk kush? Is it so usually those two? But, I mean, very very little is anything else. You know, it's every so often you might hit something that's got a little bit of sativa in it but um, or, or a bit of haze, but uh, I don't think anyone really knows the origins of what they're talking about nowadays because, you know, they don't have to select males very often. You know, only regular seed companies do. Yeah, I mean, is it safe to say that we probably won't see any FEMS being offered by you in the future for that reason? I, I, I've never, I've never, um, and I've said it right from the beginning of, of that whole thing. I, uh, Mr. Nice is, I keep it a uh, kind of regular seed company, even though we make feminized seed for other companies and we've made it for CBD crew, our other project. Um, we don't believe, we don't want people to breed with feminized seed. We would prefer them to search out real males and real females, true males and true females. <laughs> Um, and and use feminized seed or auto flowering seed for flowering, you know, and, and making um, that sort of thing. They all they all have a kind of application, as far as I'm concerned. I don't have anything against them. It's just that um, we're probably more purist at heart, and we would like to continue that. And and there's a lot more people buying our seed nowadays for the males. So uh, I don't think there there's a lot of people that can find the origins or know where they picked up that variety from and, and what it joined to in, in what year in Holland. You know what I mean? I, I'm, 
I have been doing it a long time, so I suppose that become that knowledge becomes wisdom after a period of decades. <laughs> you know what I mean? Hugely, hugely. Look, you you mentioned the CBD crew, and this is something I definitely wanted to touch on because the very first CBD I ever smoked, I got from CBD Shark Shock from uh, from some of your work. It was oh, yeah. a brilliant plant. What stimulated you to get into the CBD work? Because as far as I can tell, you were one of the first. Yeah, we were the first. We were the first by a long way. Um, I came out of uh, uh, jail in in Switzerland, and um, um, I. Uh, sort of taken the responsibility of the whole company on my shoulders for that issue. And I thought, uh, you know, THC had been, it was it was allowed for the about four or five years in Switzerland. We were making a lot of it. And then all of a sudden we had the period where it was not allowed anymore. And it kind of, I didn't, wasn't going to change my job. So I had to come out with a, a new kind of tact. And while I was in, we, we realised I was always reading and stuff. And then when I came out, I was talking to some very good friends and we um, we were talking about all the other cannabinoids. You know, maybe it's time now because we've been working with laboratories a little bit. Uh, we were one of the we were the first to work with Canna Foundation in Spain and they sponsored CBD crew to do all the testing so we could actually make a scientific seed company where we could prove every step of the way rather than Mr. Nice or the Greenhouse. That was just feeling uh, that was what I liked and hopefully other people liked it and, and uh, that, you know. So one was my opinion and the other one was science in the way. And and so CBD crew came out of self-rehabilitation, maybe, it was something like that, thinking how can I continue on working on the plant but be legal? because I had enough of being persecuted for working on a plant that doesn't know that it's illegal. I mean, you know, uh, it's the most ridiculous situation you could ever talk about. But um, I live in that world, unfortunately, and have had a lot of uh, harsh realities, and you know, and so the family gone through a lot of stuff. But I'm still here doing it. So obviously, you know, it's part of the life. And... <laughs> So you have to come to terms with it and, and try to work out the best way. And at that stage, 2006, six seven, we started delving in. And by 2009, we'd found a crew and we had already developed stuff. And then uh, we brought it to the world. And then we started, we offered it, actually, the CBD crew was the first company that went to all the other companies like Barney's Farm and Dutch Fashion and and. Uh, and uh, and uh, paradise and oh there's about 20 of them the medical seeds and like, and we offered two cbdis their their two main plants which they all sent me to two of their mothers we did the work over about uh, a year and then we gave them a sample they had to approve it and then they'd have to buy the seed off us for the first year until they worked out how to do it themselves so we, it was kind of the very first seed union I've been pushing for for many years, but I had to do it by sort of brute force and, and having something that they didn't have at the start, but, and they all wanted. And you see what happened with CBD, uh, strange. They went ballistic for a while, and uh, now, of course, you know, uh, like I said, it was agricultural, and now it's come back to being agricultural and not another another form of recreational where everyone thought the same money would be there for the CBD flowers, but it's not. It's a it's a medical product, you know. Yeah, wow. What an incredible story. And I think we all owe you, you know, a, a thank you for the perseverance on that one. Um, I guess thank I'd love you. to ask, a lot of companies out there uh, had to work from like hemp and various sort of um, stock to get that CBD. Is that how you sort of developed that initial project or did you find a special plant that happened to exhibit it? No, not at all. What we, we came, the difference between what uh, the thinking was this, that hemp had been on the market for many years and under 0.3% THC and it didn't have any value when it came to turpin profile. And I always thought turpin profile, always thought turpin profile has something very, very strong to do with the whole effect. Okay, this is before everyone um, um, hypothesized about entourage effect and that. But I always thought that when you, you found something that was exceptionally um, 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 
you know, like a pheromone, something that you really liked and you were attracted to and the flavour and the taste did something to you, then you obviously had something as well as the the CBD and the THC and whatever else was in there. So um, my idea was to come from recreational and bring it down. So bring, bring instead of bringing the THC down, up from a, um, um, a hemp variety, we decided to bring the THC down and the CBD up. And funnily enough, we had found a pure CBD plant. Um, it was uh, it was selected by a guy in Spain, and we tested it all. And that was the parent of remedy we called it. And uh, that was the parent to most everything that began this enrichment in CBD. And the reason why we did it one to one was first of all, when you take a pure THC and you take a pure CBD, the the next generation is 50 50 basically. And for me, that was the medicine. When you increase the CBD to a level of, you know, higher than the one or the 0.3%, but and you brought it up to sort of uh, 15, 16, and, and also the THC to 8 or 9 or 10, there was a completely different effect. And that was the medical, for me, that was the beginning of the medical um, concepts. And since then, I've, I've started up my own pharmaceutical company in Czech Republic as well. So. Yeah, we make a lot of um, pills and, and, and oils and we supply a lot of Australian companies with uh, base products and they do all their packaging over here under our, our label. So we, we, we branched out into that. That's why I probably left breeding a little bit and went into trying to influence other parts of the world. It's stubborn, pig-headed, I suppose, but, you know, you got to learn. As I said, we've we've all benefited from it, and, and as you said in the last answer, you know the CBD sort of had its uh, rise to fame and it's fallen down a little bit. But I'd love to hear what do you think is the future of CBD, and out of your offerings, what is it just a general CBD strain you could recommend to people if they're keen to give it a go? Well, I, I think CBD has a very big future. Uh, I just think that the hype behind it all, like the hype behind the Canadian companies going on the stock market, the hype behind all of that is just the first wave of, of silliness. You know, people with too much money that want to invest in something and think they're going to become millionaires tomorrow, they all run to one side of the ship, the ship goes down, <laughs> and then slowly you get rid of those people and you get the second wave where the ship is back standing again and now you have to kind of understand how these concepts fit in. CBD is a plant that should be grown outdoors, first of all. It doesn't need to have indoor cultivation. The flower is never enough for a person really to, to gain the full CBD effect. You need over 20%. Um, and so we make pills with 6% CBD. You take two or three. It depend, you know, you start micro and, and you go up. Um, and there's big benefits of CBD. There's no doubt about that in my mind. And uh, it, 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 I use it maybe twice or three times a week. My kids have been using it ever since I've made it. I've got about five or six pills. Like uh, we sell it now in blister packs where we, we look like a proper uh, company. And it's all uh, um, underneath the 0.3% for the European market and, and no THC for many of the products, but the CBD and the turpin. So the turpin, um, the turpin was a very big thing for us and it proved to be correct because basically when we did select a particular strain um I, it was yummy too cbd yummy too i only work with that strain it makes all my the base products it makes all the distillation so i clone it i put it outside and we grow fields of that and then we do that for the extraction so we are very specific we're not growing from seed to uh for that we are growing from clone that has been selected and been tested. And, and so I really know what we're making. Um, whereas farmers, they grow the seed varieties, they do extraction and make it into isolate. Pretty much it's a single compound, so they don't have to think about anything. They just need to get the percentages up of CBD to make it more valuable or less valuable. So there's many ways to, to go about this whole thing. But for me, CBD is agricultural. You know, that's what many people should understand. It always has been in my head and it always will be because you need to grow a large amount of biomass to extract it to make the price still normal. Right at the beginning, the price was about 80,000 uh, euros a kilo. This is when we first started because no one extracted it. 
Now you can buy for two hundred and fifty dollars a kilo. Uh, you know, this is one of the biggest drops in the world where everything's going up. That's come down. You know what I mean, big time. And so you have to be a huge industrial hemp farmer to make it profitable. Um, and and a lot of the small guys who thought they were going to make millions have all disappeared over the in the last few years. So there's still production, of course, and we still condone and we're still doing it ourselves but there's production for what you can sell and, and what your market is not just for the world and uh, so I don't suggest people will get into anything that they don't have a market for because I mean then you're just holding it and it costs money to make it so you know you can lose a lot of things yeah but I, I, I know from experience <laughs> <laughs> there you go sage advice there so Take me back to the start. What was your first experience with cannabis? Oof, jeepers, that was Lee in Melbourne um, with a group of friends. <clears throat> I remember I remember the one time I, I first got stoned um, because we, we'd smoked a few times and um, I was around 14, 15, and it didn't really happen. And I, uh, I think I'd finished school, done my HSC, started at Melbourne Uni, and... Um, went over to a mate's place on the weekend and he had, he, there was a row of houses on one side and then a strip of grass on another side. And we, we used to smoke bongs. <clears throat> and some guy down the road had given us his home grow, whatever, and we put it in the bong and it got so stoned, first time ever, you know. And I remember my me and my mate thought we saw this white line down this green strip and it went up a hill. And so we were on our knees following each other down this white line. And and then I realized when what are we doing here? You know, and I realized and we start laughing our heads off and realized we must be really stoned. This is the effect. And we laughed a six pack, you know what I mean? It felt like I, yeah, so it was a really good experience. It was ridiculous, of course, but so, so is most things in life, you know, that you laugh at. Um and yeah, that was one of the first ones I remember for sure. That's brilliant. I love that. Uh, I hope I hope other people can relate. Uh, at that time, were there did varieties have names, or was it still in that era of like just good versus less good? It was called grass, you know, and you would just get whatever the dealer or your mate had, or whoever grew it, or some friend of a friend who, you know, had, had ripped off someone's brand a branch off the that was overhanging their their fence or something. Yeah. I mean, in those days, in the in the eighties, I was landscape gardening in Melbourne, and and I um, mean, I knew where all marijuana was because we were always down the back lanes and bringing in dirt and soil and and um, and turf and stuff. And you know, you always saw when you're standing on a trailer, you can see who's growing it, one or two dope plants here and there. It didn't seem such a big thing, but there was always, you know, if cops found it, you'd have a big big adventure, unfortunately, but. I never saw it as a criminal activity, and I still don't. And, and even though I've unfortunately had some time to ponder things in in the Swiss hotels and Italian hotels, you know, um, I call them the that's the jails. Um, I I kind of never really it never diluted down my my feeling about it because the plant the plant doesn't know all this bullshit that humans put on, you know. And out of curiosity, what was the progression from sort of that point to you growing for the first time yourself? Uh, well, I mean, it was an outstanding experience and I thought, well, if I find some seeds, then I better get into this because um, I was always into um, – one of our first jobs, I was always the kind of the a bit of the leader to find work and then employ my friends, you know, and we would always be painting houses or weeding gardens, you know, and then weeding gardens started to take over and became like fixing up gardens and I slowly went into landscape gardening while I was at uni as well. So they were parallel things. And I, I just loved, I loved different varieties of plants and I liked growing things and in and, and getting harvests of fruit and from passion fruit to bananas to avocados to, I mean, I, I love all that stuff still to this day. I, I live on a in an apartment in Switzerland, and, and I still have tomatoes growing and and uh, cucumbers and all the herbs and every and I've become very Italianized. But uh, but you know, <laughs> I live on the border of Italy and Switzerland, so I kind of um, you know go there a lot and and very influenced in their food and culture. The Italians are really 
excellent at that. By the way, they're the first ones to ban all this artificial growing meat and stuff officially. So uh, I, I really like them for that, you know. They think that uh, you don't need 90 different you know, chemicals in, in something, rather than just one, and it's, you know, <laughs> and they grow it in their pastures. So I like their attitude like that, the Italians, and, and the Europeans are pretty good. You know, they're not like the Americans or the Australians or Canadians where, you know, the fast food seems to be a lot more in the culture kind of thing. Yeah, hugely, hugely. That, you know, sort of looping back to when you were speaking about Italian wines, when I started to sort of learn a bit more about them and how many indigenous varieties of grapes they have and how they grow them, it, it echoes the sentiment you just said perfectly, right? Like they, they know what's up. Yeah, well, I, I just just wanted to say that, that there's this kind of invisible line going through Europe and it, it, it touches Spain, south of France, Italy, Croatia, and it's the kind of the olive oil line, and then above that is the butter kitchen, and 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 so the north of Europe is very much dairy and stuff. And I I, I mean I've been vegetarian. I eat fish sometimes, but I, I'm mainly plant based food for the last forty years. So um, I've always been on the olive oil side because it's very different kind of um, taste and Mediterranean cooking. And so um, the, the the wealth of knowledge that the farmers from these areas had, um, I go to Barola, it's two hours from my home, you know, and it's probably one of the greatest places in the world. And Nebbiolo is probably my favourite grape of all time. Tempranillo and Nebbiolo, you know, they're up there in there. And so, of course, uh, it's the time, truffles, porcini, mushrooms, and, and uh, the they're harvesting the dolcetto and and uh, and uh, the barbera and and now they're probably this week they're doing the nebbiolo. So uh, it's the same time as the harvest for for our outdoor marijuana. It's funny, but, you know. Uh, I kind of I kind of keep an eye on it all. And I live in an area where there's all merlot. I mean, it's this part of Switzerland, it's all merlot. I'm not a big fan of merlot, but I mean, I live amongst the, the vineyards here, so. Um, it's just interesting to to um, um, kind of draw parallels from agriculture, you know, and the experience that our grandparents had. Uh, they used to always grow vegetable gardens, and even you know, Australia was you couldn't go to every shop to buy all that stuff. Sometimes you had to you know sort of do it yourself. And uh, my grandfather on my father's side and my mum's side, they were both avid gardeners. So I suppose I, I, I got the bug from that kind of beginning. There you go, intergenerational. I love that. There's uh, a lot of good points there, and, and I love that you're a Nebbiolo fan. Uh, we're, we're kindred spirits there. <laughs> so, yeah, I, yeah. Well, if you get over here, I've, I've got quite a big uh, collection. I have to say, get drunk. The Australian scene. It uh, unfortunately, I've only got one bottle of Barolo because they they like to mark it. <laughs> but that's all good. That's all good. Maybe we can visit that another time. So, to loop back to the the last question. How did you progress from sort of when you were first getting into it to doing that initial work in Mullumbimby? And was that where you would say you first sort of got deep into the scene or would you say it was before that? Uh, it was a bit before that. I, I, I was growing down. But, the, I mean, that was my early days in Melbourne Uni and, and um, my girlfriend, uh, her, her, she'd grown up um, in Melbourne and then moved up to Maynard in near Mullumbimby. And I had a company called Main Arm Landscaping. Uh, I named it after that, but it was in Melbourne. And, and I used to go sort of do uni, uh, work a little bit in the landscaping, and then I would go up to uh, Mullum uh, kind of once a month or that during the uni time. And, and because we were growing dope outside, um, uh, you kind of had to check on that. And, you know, it was all very illegal. And bringing it down on the train, you know, sort of uh, – I don't know, a, a, a kilo or whatever, to a, a pillow. It was all sewn in to a pillow and, and, you know, plastic wrapped and we didn't have the vacuum seals in those days, but we made it as as good as we could. And and we would sell it in, in a matter of hours in, 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 in Melbourne, you know, to all my uni friends. I mean, we were just basically <laughs> supplying um the uni guys and, and, we, and that was so special, that marijuana. It, it really reminds me. I think it's very, very much uh, um, the same as Neville Hayes, but it was a outdoor growing um, Thai 
Thai Colombian mixtures for sure. They were definitely in, involved in that, and they were very long leaf and 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 you know that that became huge plants, but. You could bend them over and and sort of train them as well. So you know, to Operation Noe used to always be going on. You know, at certain times of the year up there, the helicopters were flying and the motorbike cops were going in to try to bust grow. So yeah, we survived all of that, and no one got really maybe lost a few plants here and there to a few people, but had to worry about brown snakes and, and shit like that more than anything else. So, I mean, that was more terrorising, you know. Uh, we kind of cut our teeth on a different way, I suppose, in Australia. You know, it was, it was kind of good. Yeah, wow, that that's legendary. And, I mean, in terms of the Mullen Madness, I think the question I hear the most is, what's the genetics? And you just gave a, a good answer to that. How did those genetics come about? Was it just something that your friends had access to and you wanted to improve it? Oh, you know, there, there, there's a couple of um, schools of thought and, and I don't want to um, sort of put anyone down who was in that period of time. But in that period of time, there was no real, um, it's not like now where we shared knowledge. You know, if you were a dope grower, kind of people knew you were a dope grower, but you didn't really talk about it. You know, you didn't even, you didn't want to put yourself in the problem's way and you didn't want to show that you knew that someone else was in problem's way in case they got. Um, however, sometimes you became friendly with a few and you'd swap some seeds with this person. They'd just come back from a travel in Thailand or someone had come back from Colombia with some Panama red or someone had come back from uh, another spot, uh, you know, uh, Cambodia or, or, or Laos or something. And, I think a lot of Australians were in that whole Banda Archer and, and in 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 the eighties, the seventies and eighties, a lot of people were travelling, hippies were travelling and bring in collecting seed. I collected for wax jam boot, I collected for fruit for everything and, and of course Australia is not legal to bring back, so we used to send it and hide it in things when we sent it back in the post. And so a lot of things came from let's just say areas but unknown origins. You know, and our version of Mullen Mimi Madness was very similar uh, to what we re re recreated with the Neville's Haze. And as far as I'm concerned, it was a very long flowering plant. Um, it was absolutely mind blowing when it came to smoking it and the flavors. And it had an alpine, spicy, um, menthol, um, uplifting um, effect, you know, and it was, uh, it was psychedelic. It, was, it still is, if you take too much, of course. But, I mean, if you balance those things uh, um, and then you get used to them sometimes, so you have to mix it up with different varieties to, to keep everything good. But, yeah, I suppose the origins for us came from all those areas that I mentioned, yeah. Amazing. You know, I, I think the reason why it's so popular is because there's so much sort of allure and mystery around it. And in Australia, you know, Every uh, every avid grower in Mullumbimby likes to think they've got the original Mullum Madness. So I'd be curious to know: did you do you ever really give the seeds out, or was it more just something you kept for yourself? I did give our version of seeds to several people, uh, growers over the years that are requested, and um, I've still got them in the fridge upstairs in the office. And um, I have a lot of uh, um, um, strains that I collected, and, and you know they're all noted, and they've been you know I've got stuff from the late 80s still in the fridges from Neville's stock and my stock and, and you know, and still germinates, but much less, of course. If you keep it vacuum sealed in fridges and not taken in and out all the time, you, you can keep seed for quite a long time. Just the germination levels go down and and we've managed to get back. Um, if so, uh, at the moment, we've got a, a couple of um, old northern lights, uh two and some ortega by ortega and pure haze um variety of pure haze we I've, I've busted out a few old seed to see if we can get them something going from them as well because we've got a bit of room in our research area now and i would like to revive a couple of really old hash plant that's it we got one um uh it's a four-way indica kind of thing uh, the original hash plant. The ones I've seen all over the net, they don't look anything like the hash plant that I remember working on with Neville. Um, and so you kind of, I'm a bit inspired to correct, not correct, just 
to put out an original version to show you what we thought was hash plan. You know, nowadays names mean shit and they mean nothing actually because no one's giving origins of where plants or varieties come from, and so it's very 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 difficult thing for someone who's got an inquisitive mind to try to um understand where does that strain originate from is it afghani original is it uh, mexican is it you know what i mean it, so they're all hybrid by hybrids by chemical hybridization so it, it, it's kind of losing its uh that's what i meant by the breeding has kind of been watered down and 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 it became um too quick you know people you know, if you want something good in life, you, you've got to spend a bit of time on it and make sure that you test everything properly to make sure that people are getting what you're saying. And not a lot of that is going on anymore, unfortunately. You know, testing happens when you buy the seed and you're the tester and the purchaser and the retailer and the consumer. So you become, you know, and I know so much about all the other seed companies. Uh, I mean, you know, the exaggerations that have, have put on and for some reason a lot of um people in the world believe that seed companies that have been in holland for many years are all legal and they've been doing the right thing and and they're all not legal actually i mean seeds are made with growing higher thc than 0.3 and that's still not legal you know um it's tolerated if you're not caught <laughs> So, uh, unfortunately, to this day, that's the actual stance that still, you know, they just, they allow a little bit going on uh, in, in Holland and in certain countries now because it, it's not really as dangerous as they probably thought and they probably prefer to get the electricity paid rather than stolen. So, you know, the, the, these things are now slowly coming to the server 20, 30 years, but, but most things... I mean, like, there's companies that say they were being established since 1985 and that. There were no seed companies in those days, you know what I mean? There were companies that happened in the 90s. Maybe Neville was one of the first ones, I think, in the late 80s anyway, 87, 88. Um, but, you know, it just there's a lot of fabrication to companies trying to merge into things, but they've got no history behind them. And if you check, you realise that they're all exaggerating things. So... I don't know. I don't really work, live in that world anymore. <laughs> I prefer to live in our world and, and, and we just do uh, whatever sort of job that we think is correct, you know. Yeah, that's awesome to hear. And look, a, a number of really awesome talking points you just mentioned. I'd love to just quickly loop back, you know, because you mentioned the hash plant that you're familiar with is not really the one you see these days. The, the cutting these days that gets discussed as the one that we think you may have been working with is people call it the PNW hash plant. Do you know much about this and how would you describe the one that you worked with? The the, the one that – I don't know what the PNW hash plant is. I, I'm, I'm not so much – I mean, I'm on my own forum and I'm on my Instagram, but I, I don't really do too much social media. Um, this is probably the third podcast in my life, so you know what I mean – um, so uh, I kind of maybe um, um, a bit ignorant about what everyone talks about, but there um, a lot of people weren't even born when when I had versions out. You know what I mean? So it's very difficult for them to know what. <laughs> it's very difficult for them to really understand. They're only believing stories that have been passed down to them. So let's just um, acknowledge that. That's okay, and, and I'm not trying to say that anyone's got the wrong version or anything. Um, it's just that, um, like the White Widow, for example, when we first made it, we made White Widow, and it was particularly this mother with this father. People bought the S1 seed, the, uh, and then next year every company had White Widow. But it wasn't the original version, and many people think because it's called White Widow, it's the insane. Well, it's the selection of the person who's doing the breeding then, and it's slightly different. It's like what we talked about with the winemaking there. If you put all the same tools together, people select different ratios and different things in, in you know, that's just the individuality of, of the person blending. And uh, and so for me, our, our original um, hash plant, what it looks like is very strong, very sturdy stem, first of all, really upright. You don't need to stick it. You don't need to uh, uh, hold it for weight or anything. And then... Um, it, it grows very uh, upright uh, um, stems where the flowers are on, and it's a very, it's a bit reddish, 
reddish purple maroon aura to it. Uh, and it's very pungent. It's got four different types of um, indicas involved in, in in the hash plant. And uh, like gravity, that was the original um, one part before it. We it was a plant that we made with a series of indicas as well. So that yeah, we kind of and the and one distinct thing about the hash plant it was what, when it was flowering, it made very yellow um, uh, um, hairs. At the uh, exceptionally yellow was something you could see with this reddish aura kind of leaf and uh, very strong stem, and then a very yellow, yeah, so uh, yellow kind of hairs on the flower. So, um, that was the version what uh, we'd been working on for a while, and we'd selected and gone down the inbreed inbreeding road for maybe three or four generations. And I must say to everybody, I mean, once you buy seeds from different companies and you do three or four generations down, it's nothing to do with what it originally was. It's pretty much to do with your selections and, and then it becomes the origins are nice to know where they come from, but it becomes yours. You, then you have a claim to rename it in a way, you know, but not when you squirt gelato and then, you know, you do it with Girl Scout cook. I mean, you, you're just re-hybridising hybrids, you know what I mean? And that's mainly for flavours most of the time. So I suppose, you know, the the American market dictates a lot of things to um, create a, a frenzy around things, but a lot of it's to do with Kush and Skunk getting stoned and flavoursome, you know, and then um, like... You know that might be really good, sort of for uh, 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 um, for the majority of people in the states. But over in Europe, for example, some people don't want to get too stoned, but they like to have an uplifting effect, and so they smoke a, a lot more sativa. You know, or the old school Californians or the Hawaiians, they were smoking a lot more sativa -y kind of influence plants. So it's just it's different. I mean, there's no best one. It's just they're all. They're all damn good on a good day, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I like that sentiment. That's beautiful. And and you just touched on a, a topic which is really prevalent, which is it feels like sativas are becoming less and less common or maybe less demanded. Do you feel like we're going to reach a point where sativas are almost impossible to find or do you think there'll always be a little group of diehards? Oh, they'll, you know, I mean, most of our, our, uh, our sales – if if I were to go on, it's pretty much gone back to hazes. Uh, anything with the haze in the name, we're selling um, much more this year than ever before. So um, I think what happens is it you know there's cycles for fashion, there's cycles for haircuts, there's cycles for everything, and eventually long hair comes back into fashion if you stay there long enough, you know. And uh, uh, I'm not saying anything about that, but. I mean, uh, I kind of just know that when you stick to something good um, and you you continue to make it in in a good way, there'll always be a market for it. And um, some people really don't like the the psychotic that kind of it almost want to vomit, throw up of, uh, effect from hazes because some of them are very very from zero to a hundred, you know, and you you kind of um, you know sometimes they're a bit off-putting for people who are very sensitive to um, THC, and so it's not for everyone. But then now there's Nebbiolo or, or, or you know, Tempranillo, and, you know, some people like white wine, some people prefer Franciacorta or, or Champagne or Cava, and it's just, you know, it's, it's a – I look at it as an individual medicine. Once you find a strain that really does something to you, the master kush scum for example the master kush used to always make me very creative i would start writing i would drawing i would design things I, I would you know and every time i used it it was always the same effect and i felt wow that was that's a really interesting and you know, i used to start to use it for that um whenever i had to do something i would i would go for the master kush uh, as distinct from, say, early queen would be a completely different effect, another flavour completely different off the charts, you know. And so uh, there was, I mean, I think there'll be always a market for hazes um, and I think people are slowly getting a little bit, you know, sort of dizzy from um, um, all of the things that are going around at the moment. And, and let's face it, I mean, it's very hard to replicate these things if you don't feminise them because there's, 
there's not many people really keeping, you know, sort of doing research into, you know, 100, vari- 100 seeds of, I don't know, tsunami and 100 seeds of, uh, uh, of uh, gelato and then finding males and then tr- seeing what happens to them. They're mainly just squirting them with the macho stuff and off we go, you know what I mean? And uh, I don't think you really need I, – I consider them producers of seed. I don't consider them breeders. So, um uh, again, I'm just making definitions for myself for, to to how I, I do my business with other people. I mean, a lot of seed companies come to us because they don't have the rooms and they want something produced, and I would always do that. And, you know, we agree on something if we had spare rooms going at one stage. And, you know, that, that's we, we, we did a lot of help. I don't do it so much anymore because I got burnt a few times. But the thing is that uh, um, you still try. I mean, it's silly not to try if you've got the opportunity and you'll never know what you learn from from things and you never know what doors open from when you think one door is opening and maybe it was something completely different. And, you know, if you're open to all of that, you, you'll you'll have no problem, you know. But if you're not open to it, don't start this job. <laughs> <laughs> no, we've, we've certainly heard that sentiment before, you know, and uh, – you're, you're right, there is a big distinction between, you know, the, the ways people made seed back in the day with larger numbers versus now. I want to quickly ask you, you mentioned, you know, Hayes is on the up and up in terms of popularity, and I've certainly noticed this, and I think part of the allure is that unique high, and specifically, people always talk about how there's no ceiling on the Hayes, you know, you just keep going if you keep hitting it. And I guess my question would be, why do you think some of the older, more sort of special genetics have no ceiling, whereas a lot of the newer stuff, the gelatos, the cookies, they don't have that, like there's like a ceiling. You just get to a point and that's it. I don't think um, – when you when when you breed, um, when you make a selection from, um, um, say, land races originally, you know, let, let's go right back to it. I mean um, – you make a selection for a particular reason. When in Mr. Nice, we I would look for the structure of the plant, the stability. Um, I, there's a few things that tell me it's stable, and then I would start to go uh, affect. How does it affect me? How does it look when we? Uh, what's the yield? How does it uh, handle humidity? Uh, various things like that. And I would say that um, we considered each trait before. Nowadays, they're pumping it out so fast. It's like banana with apple. Uh, you make a new gel- a, a, a new ice cream. And then they're making flavours and then they're starting to bring in flavouring that's not naturally there and they start to... And for me, it's, um, it's discontrol when it comes to that because you've, you've only selected for one or two traits and not five or six traits which used to be selected for and effect is one of those ones that i i consider i've smoked all of this new stuff we have a lot of it we make seeds for certain companies of this new stuff it looks nice it smells great uh, they all look like um skunks and cushions and and different versions of that sort of kind of type of origin if i generally just say um, um and for me they none none of them have made me want to go back and smoke them for effect they maybe flavor um and sometimes for couch lock you know i'm not a real big fan for that but sometimes it's funny to to kind of you know sort of go to sleep in a in a kind of narcotic state but um i would say that that the the general thing is that they they're lacking in in trait selection and and so that's where I, where you get a ceiling on the the i mean they're going up to 20 they're just trying to prove that they're so high in THC, but that's not what gets you stoned only you know it's everything and if you think about it turpins are in such small quantities they must be so powerful you know, much more powerful than a THC or a CBD uh, component on a plant. So the turbines, you, you, you 0.006 milli, you know, percent, uh, milli, milligrams on, on a thing has that effect. If you put 0.008, it changes it completely. So turbines for me have, they're used in such small concentrations for a reason. You don't find plants with more than 
three, I mean, once you dry it around three, one to three percent would be a turpin profile that most plants would have in, in concentration of turpin. Not eight, nine, ten, twelve, you know, what whatever they're doing nowadays. It's like you're you're super you you know, you you you're super pimping a, a plant flavor. Uh, because you know, the American market wants to taste more and more and more. Texas is not, you know, bigger is not only better. We we things that have refined, that have a flavor, that have kind of a depth to it, and have, you know, it's like wine again. I, I hate, I don't mean to bring it up all the time, but it. I, I base it on wine, olives, and cannabis. For me, are the three most important plants in the world, and they run together. The olives come a little bit later than the wine, but they I could grow them all together very comfortably. And um, and there's a lot of parallels in those industries because when you taste certain olives, of course, you've got flavours and you've got low flavours and then you've got very intense flavours and then you've got uh, different chem chemical components on, on the olive oil. And, you know, so when you start to look at agricultural products and then you understand um, things like that, then you'll see that, that that's the – then you understand what you're looking at for a change, you know, and then you start to go – Oh, that's the bit I like. You know, it's that uh, better carafenol is the turpin that I, I'm, I'm finding that spicy kind of black peppery. I like that. And that's, and then you start to pick things and you see it. If you analyze all the plants that you've selected, you might see that they're quite high in that particular turpin as well. So yes, there's a, there's, um, with the tools that we've, um, we've advanced with and used right throughout the agricultural industry and, and adapted to cannabis. We're definitely now exposing things that have been there, but now we can see them. We maybe, you know, they weren't in concentration. That's why hashes, for example, where you concentrate uh, a flowering field to just a particular condensed uh, um, uh, resin gland, uh, a pile of resin gland, you get a much better understanding of that plant from making a small bit of hash and, and the effect of the medium if it's from a seed crop, for example. So, you know, there's methods to this madness, would you believe, you know? <laughs> would you believe? No, I love that. So much wisdom there. I think we'll all have to go back and listen to that again and highly encourage everyone to check out Gordal Olives. They changed my life. Um, I'm just going to quickly ask you, because you mentioned it a few questions ago. You, you spoke about the Mr. Nice forums, and I think these have to be a staple in the community over the years in terms of a place where people could go, share knowledge, find knowledge. Um, lots of amazing posts on there. I wanted to ask you, how has it affected you Running this forum over the years, you know, have you learned any cool things? Anything surprisingly come out of it? Oh, <clears throat> I mean, I um, at right at the beginning, I was doing it on Heaven Stairway in Canadian Forum. Of one of, I was one of the first breeders to be accessible all the time. Um, I kind of started in the not late nineties, being uh, moderating it my own site and, and and doing it from ourselves when stairway to heaven was busted and they went um richard went down um we all started to open up our own sites and that's when i, I suppose um it was kind of ready when i left greenhouse um and moved to switzerland and then opened up mr nice uh, already i opened up this night um, we started to do a website and then I realised how important it was to actually be accessible to talk to individuals who had relevant questions. Um, they couldn't get that from a shop that was selling our seeds always. So, um, uh, and I prefer one-on-one um, -on -one, um, at the end of, if you speak to, you know, five people a day, at the end of the year, there's 1,500 more people that you've influenced and you slowly... After a hundred thousand years, you, you've influenced a lot of people. <laughs> That's how long I feel like I've been doing it for. But um, I, I think this, uh, the forum was very essential. Uh, still is. Um, I tried to be laissez faire with it and and allow people to police themselves. So I got into a bit of problem when the community got too big. Uh, over over sort of fifty thousand, then you start getting hecklers and you get people that are just there to disrupt and. I don't know why. I mean, I don't know, have time to do that sort of thing. I never even thought about it. But 
uh, all of a sudden on the websites and social media you get things that you've never thought about and and you have to deal with them and uh Luckily, I've just got um, really good growers involved who try to keep it real. And and now Mushashi, one of the mod- the main moderator, uh, along with me on the site, is um, he's a he's he's older than me. He's in his seventies. He's a wonderful guy. He's very feet on the ground, balanced guy. Um, sort of dilutes down any in house arguing and keeps it real and relevant and. So I expect that um, you know, as the community and, and and grows and and we get bigger as well as we're growing, um, you need to kind of um, you know, if you come into our house, this is what the kind of limits here, and then you have to do that. And I never thought about those things before. I didn't think about limits, but you know, unfortunately, everybody's different in this world, and they don't all kind of see eye to eye. So. You know, respectful. Let's just say I, I like people to be respectful to each other, whether they uh, have completely different backgrounds. You know, I have no problem with that. I've never really been racist or sexist or anything like that. I don't care. As long as they can do the job, I'm all ears, you know. And so for me, that was always important. And we employed every every race, every well, there's only two sexes as, well, as far as I'm concerned. I'm still breeding, but you know that that you know XX and XY, I call them. And so we're, <laughs> I don't want to get involved in any of that. But uh, uh, still, to this day, I'm uh, you know I have to deal with that. I don't have other things to deal with. We kill guys. That's good to hear your perspective, and I I can certainly appreciate your sentiment about um you know people will come up with some talking points and ideas you'd never even considered once you've been exposed to enough of them. But uh, one of, one of the, the things I definitely wanted to ask you was, um, you know, over the years, I've seen a lot of people draw references to some of the much later posts that Neville made on the forum. And they would use screenshots and be like, oh, you know, this says that you're like, not you, Shanti, is in like someone they're talking to on the internet. They'd be like, well, you're actually incorrect because Neville said this here. And some of the stuff he said did go against the grain of what had been sort of accepted. I guess from your point of view, did did you see anything that you weren't quite sure was real or did it all check out from your point of view? No, uh, you know... um, Let's say that was possibly a fault of my own because in in the uh, when I finally got Neville to become come in and and go online because he never he avoided that for years and years. When he came in, he um, let's just think about the words. He's not he was not the easiest guy to get along with always. Okay, he was definitely. Um, coming from, he was slightly older than me, but he 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 come from a hard knock school. Uh, he thought um, the the community or the people it kind of um, owed a little bit to him for uh, more than what he he'd, he'd received or what he'd been sort of dealt out in in some of the unfortunate problems he had early on. Um, and so um, I'm just setting the scene for that. Uh, um, it was kind of. He had sometimes he had a little bit of a chip on his shoulder for certain things. Uh, his information about um, varieties and strains were usually always correct. And there was a time when he started to diverge from us. Uh, Howard and I went in, wanted, invited him into the CBD crew. At that stage, he was still with us and he wanted to go on with so-called um, seed donations he'd got from people over the years and he, he was recreating higher THC stuff and he was in Australia and he was working with some guy and then it started to go a bit funny because he started to direct traffic towards what he believed to be the next new things and and he he was um, quite wrong uh, and, and made a lot of promises to people and, and maybe didn't come good with them and he slowly made a few um, people upset and um, I had to take him off the moderation there and then we we split ways when we went into the CBD stuff because we concentrated on that one and he really wanted I think he was living in Western Australia he went he he, he got some contracts with uh, some companies that were going into the cannabis thing and then they never saw him they paid a lot of money and, and he he um, 
maybe it was going downhill then. Um, I, I, I don't know the last part of, I wasn't, I, I tried to talk to him a bit. He, he got a bit angry uh, with myself um, because of how we had to go our own ways. And um, he never came back to Europe and, um, you know, I sort of maintained all of the, the plant stock and the seed stock. And I've been doing that since 2001 when he left kind of thing. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it, it's difficult uh, to understand what um, he, he was probably sick at, at a certain stage and I, I wasn't really aware. Only his family were really quite aware about that. Um, but I loved him. He was a great guy. He, he was a, a, a fountain of uh, knowledge for me. And he was, uh, it was great to have a peer in that thing, especially in a foreign country where we're both Australian, you know, it's kind of just accidental, you know, it was like, I mean, I always called, I, I, I think I did an interview once with him telling and I called it, how did they see me? And I said, accidental hero. We kind of felt like we were accidental heroes because we didn't know where we came from, it was all still illegal. I mean, we were criminals over there, but we never thought that way. Unfortunately, Neville had that problem in, in, in Western Australia where they kept him there and then I, I think uh, then Ben Dronkers took over the castle and he was never really very fair in Neville's eyes what he did. And so just it was the, it was the, the seed of, of discontent, unfortunately, and, and you know, I can't really talk for for Neville or, or anyone else, um, but yeah, we don't. We 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 actually split at, in the what, 2009, 10 around that when CBD crew started to take off, um, and then I had to take him off the website as well. I left everything up there. I'm not a guy to to take down stuff and and try to pretend it didn't happen. Um, but uh, there is still very good stuff, and and I don't know. Many people believe that they they knew Neville, but they I don't think uh, I think they met him later on in life, and you know maybe it was a different Neville. We all changed in, in life, and you know. But I remember him well. Sorry. No, no, no. You're all good, and that that's a that's a brilliant answer. And you know we've we've been fortunate enough to speak to a few people who you know obviously didn't know him as well as you, but knew him to an extent, and they all sort of echoed a similar sentiment that um you know he at times he wasn't the most easiest guy to get along with. So you know um, I've always discussed it as you know maybe there's an element of needing to separate the art from the artist sort of thing in a sense. Um, but nevertheless, let's loop back to just after those Mullum days. I want to know what was the progression to you packing your bags and heading to Europe and jumping headfirst into it all. Um, you know, I mean, I I studied in, I went to Haileybury College in Melbourne. I came from a very different background and you know, finished a Melbourne Uni degree and and science degree, and and then I. Um, I was landscaping and I was traveling every for three months a year. And I thought, you know, I bought a house and renovated it at, at 22 or something. And I kind of done all the stuff that you meant to do. And, and, and it didn't really do it for me. You know, I thought I better, I, I suppose I had a bit of a, a, a kind of inquisitive mind. And, and I just, every time I traveled, it was, right, it was like the university of life. It was just, open up experiences and people and and foods and and cultures and shit that you looked at a book but it was never the same you know it was like that was two-dimensional this was three-dimensional and so i traveled um i just got addicted to the traveling and i wasn't meaning to become a a, a, a marijuana breeder at any stage i just collected things that i liked along the way and then i didn't want to go home I started to um, um, collect rough stone, opal and, and sapphires and stuff in my collect it, while I was collecting seeds and fruit seeds and I started getting interested in, in, in gemstones and I ended up in Jaipur in India and I, was, I have um, had a motorbike and I would employ a couple of guys and we were cleaning up rough opal and selling it in the market there and... And that took me to um, um, to Amsterdam. That was the reason why I went originally there because it was a very big coloured stone, well known for being coloured stone and for gems. And I went there for that reason with a bunch of coloured stones cut and looking great down my pants and, and went into Europe and 
And I started going around to jewellery places and I slowly uh, met people in Amsterdam that were definitely not like jewellery people in France or England. They were pretty uh, much into smoking and having a good time and drinking a beer and then talking about making new kind of settings. And so a lot of people were smoking dope and I was smoking dope. And then um, we had friends that brought in different hashes from different countries and we'd all start talking and start exchanging and slowly buying and selling and wheeling and dealing. And and because I had such a bunch of seeds, I, I kind of it was in the back of the mind to eventually find a place to crack these open. And um, I suppose in the early 90s, um, um, that's when it started to, like a few I found some people who were growing. And then and then by, I think it was 92, it was, I met Aria. And then by 94, we um, we actually established the seed company, the greenhouse seed company, and then ninety five we won. I didn't enter the first year; I entered the second year, and then we won with White Widow and White Rhino and White Shark. And every year we started to until ninety eight when I I left and we won. Hannibal and I tried; we won about eleven out of thirteen cups that year. So, yeah, we we kind of ha- it was not a, a, a planned thing until we started to. It started to show a, a clear road that this was able to be done in it's the right country to do it in, and so Holland was absolutely wonderful for that. But the rest of the world gave a, a, a big ground to, you know, sort of good base to understand people and 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 different agricultures and and different cultures and, and different things. So it was, it's very difficult to explain. But I mean, you know, it, it was coming out of the washing machine specifically for that line you know what i mean and i came out and i i kind of knew when i started it that i love to do that so you know it was just like that that's brilliant and you you really uh solidified that you're a true collector we can add gemstones to the list i love that um I, i'd love I still to have a lot <laughs> oh wow <laughs> there you go so I guess my question is, you know, would you say that that job at Greenhouse with Arian was sort of your first real industry job? And how did you meet Arian? Um, my, my girl, uh, the girl that I was um, going out with, and she's a Dutch girl, and she was doing um, all of the interiors, uh, helping Arian. She was good friends with Arian, Brenda, the, uh, his wife. And uh, um, we got friendly, all four of us, and we um, he asked what, what would be interesting to keep me in Europe at that stage. And I said, well, if we set up a seed company, it would be great. I didn't really want to be a coffee shop owner or anything like that. So I helped with buying materials, you know, he didn't really know black ashes and stuff. And and so I would be, you know, sort of working uh, parallel with that side of things. And then probably uh, um, I convinced him to, all four of us went into that at the beginning of 94. I mean, there there was a period of time when yourself, Arian, and Neville were working for Greenhouse, I believe. What was that like, and what strains came out of that collaboration? Oh, I mean, um, well, let, let's just look at it like this. I mean, <clears throat> Arian had a coffee shop. Had had at that time he had two or three. Uh, I'd worked on the water and built a waterfall, and, and I'd helped a lot with um, building up those things and then buying stuff. And Neville and I were growing separately. We, it, Neville was growing stuff and I was growing stuff. And because we were pretty good at our things, be, people didn't have these strains, so we could offer them to Aria and he would buy them and put them in the coffee shop in the menu and they would be the only place you could get them in Amsterdam. So everyone slowly, Super Silvais, for example, Master Kush, uh, uh, um, the, the, our versions at that stage, the White Widow, the White Rhino, that we call it Medicine Man now, the Shark, and um, and then uh, I suppose that, that were the one. El Nino was probably the last one that did a greenhouse, and then I went to Mister Nice, and we did Critical Mass and continue. So we kind of always grew and kept our mothers separate. That was another business. So we were growers, and then we would offer the finished material to the coffee shop and because he paid better money than everybody else to get the first right of refusal to see everything everyone wanted to sell it to the greenhouse but neville and i we sold quite you know and we set prices at sativas is they took twice as long than indicas so we'd have to need twice as much money and 
that's how the price structure started to come out and, you know, sort of Dr. Gaborki and Shane came one time there and, you know, Northern Light 5 Hayes was in the, the mix there. And so they were always 50% sativa, so they would be worth a little bit more value. So say if the Indicas, um, the ones, the six to seven week flowering ones, the orange bud and everything like that, they were around, say, 6,000 guilders or five 6,000 guilders, then... Neville's Hayes, which took double, would be 12000 at cost to the coffee shop. So we were making huge money on one kilo then, um, and that that inspired people to sort of compete and, and try to do a better job. And if you were able to sell stuff to uh, these places at certain money, that was bragging rights between the growers, and, you know, you got eight grand for that and not six grand like a commercial. So... It, it improved the growing. Uh, definitely, it was a it was a good thing for the whole industry in the nineties. We were all doing it for the brotherly love, and we made money. Of course, we made money, but it wasn't the focus. It, uh, we, we all knew we were going to sell it to one of the coffee shops, but we wanted to aim for the highest price. So, I suppose uh, it's like any agricultural thing that um, we started to compete. Neville and I a little bit by by that time, and and just. Uh, you know, he would he would edge me out most of the time, uh, first and second many times. You know, we kind of I edged him out uh, before he started. It was the White Widow. We would we came in and made our our name, and then he started to come in and and, and bring in um, Super Sewer Haze and uh, Northern Life Five Haze and uh, various other things. So, I mean, it was healthy competition, let's say, and we all became better growers for it. So, uh, and then, and then, and then, the coffee shops had had products that they they were unique, and so if you wanted them, you had to go to that coffee shop. So that was a benefit for them as well. So it kind of benefited everybody. That kind of disorder. I used to have. I on my Mister Nice season said support disorganized crime because that was pretty much what we were. We were, we were. There was no mafia or anything like what people were romantically believed. We were all. Uh, all over the place, mate, and just don't get caught. That was the only, yeah, that was that was all that we we live by. Don't get caught. Don't let anyone follow you, and and don't uh, don't have any issues. So, uh, thank you. Brilliant. <laughs> oh, look, I, I love that motto. That's that's brilliant. Support disorganized crime. So, I guess I'd be wondering, um, when when did you meet Howard? I have the other one on the backside. It said permanent state of temporary. <laughs> <laughs> that's on the mr nice t-shirt that we used to make oh there you yeah. go i love it we need to bring it back yeah. so so what was your introduction to howard and how did you springboard from that point to making mr nice with him um it, a, a girl she's um from a mixed race family from england she came over and, and was became a client and was used to buy four or five kilos of different marijuanas from us from me specifically, and we became friendly and I found out that her father was a cop in England and I kind of said, well, well how did you get into this? She said, yeah, well, I, I read this book and, and then one time she came over with it and gave me the book. I didn't know anything about this guy. Uh, it, was, it must have been around 95. And I started reading the book, couldn't put it down, fucking read the whole thing and it was like, and I realised I met this guy at the High Times Cannabis Cup, uh, and he was talking to me in this strange accent, Welsh, and and we hit it. We were we just had a funny um, um, rapport, and um, and then uh, the next year he came over to the Milky Way, and we actually we won a lot of things. And he said, um, he asked me if if uh, an old bloke like him had any chance to to start up um, a, a business together. And then I said to him, I know who you are. And then I, and then we started talking and then he, he just got out of jail in America. It was 96. I think it was very early, just very early on. And, and, and uh, I was uh, 95, 96. Yeah. 96, I think. And we just hit it off. He was just the nicest, the most intelligent gentleman's gentleman. I only have high, high regards and high praise for him because he was a 
he was absolutely lovely partner and he was a wonderful human being and um, I really enjoyed and in fact got inspired to make the seed company work so we had more reasons to bump into each other in ex expos and and spend time together so actually we weren't we weren't uh, sort of motivated by the big bucks and all of that we were more motivated by getting together to get a few beers and get stoned together and that became you know sort of quite regular at certain stage and then we got jobs for talking and and doing the expo uh, uh lectures and stuff and and uh we had a good time it was just a, uh i met him through this girl who was smuggling um uh, back to england and, and by by chance she gave me the book and so that was the kind of um there was no no uh, wonderful outrageous story but it was a funny story because she contacted me just recently after many years of not seeing her. She said, you probably don't remember me, but I'm this lady. And, and of course I did. And she, she asked me, she was living in Germany now and she was asking me about things. And it's funny. I, I have that kind of, um, um, I lost a lot of contact with many people due to experiences in life and, and, and then re got it back later on when things became an industry you know what i mean people started to come out of the woodwork and and be seen uh, i'd already as howard said we were unsuccessful criminals because we got caught and so we became we became kind of faces and before that we were invisible and we could do everything so once you become a face you have to change your job you know what i mean and like consultant at least not touching it every day so <clears throat> For me, I, I, I just made it into the medical market so we could make it into a job, and, and that's been the focus for the last, since the CBD crew, I suppose. Yeah, brilliant story there. Love to hear that. So uh, I'd love to quickly ask you before we look at getting into some of our final questions, what would be your advice for an aspiring breeder, someone who wants to get into the scene but wants to do it right? Well, I mean, you know, I, I don't know. Um, I think a, a lot of a, a lot of um, my story uh, in this world is probably timing, and and I was at the right place at the right time. And I, I I do believe there are other people out there that have definitely as good a goods and and have worked on certain lines as and are, are very private. And there is definitely some excellent people out there that have got some uh, gems um however uh to bring it to the the public is a very different game you know you have to be ready to to cop criticism and and go through a lot of uh regulatory bodies and and things so to do it legally nowadays is, is kind of um it's a wonderful thing it's a great thing um black was much easier i must say white is more red tape and blue tape and green tape uh, but with licensing uh, comes um, um, proudness of what you're doing and, and, and holding your head up high. And so breeding is yet to be, I wouldn't say that it's a, um, it's a sought after job. Cultivating has been a sought after job um, at, recently. But I believe that, that eventually the, the, that we'll go back to what will make this company different is the the variety or the effect of the particular plant they've developed in house and it's only available there and that will be the discerning factor between companies in the future not just producing cannabinoid and and sort of regurgitating the same stuff you're going to have to have something special and so i believe breeders will will come back into being um eventually Maybe not for every company, but, you know, for, for many. Yeah, hopefully that's some, some great advice there. So moving on to our final five quickfire questions we'd love to ask guests. The first one is, what's your favourite creation that you've made? And then as a follow-up, what's a creation you're fond of that was made by someone else? Um, my favourite to this day is mango haze. Um, there's no doubt that uh, I put a lot of time and effort into that. And I really, when I have it, uh, I smoke it straight away. So, I mean, pr proofs in if we have 10 different marijuanas on the table, the first one that's used is the popular one. 
and that's usually mango haze. That's how I work it out. Second, uh, I mean, it would be very close to Neville's haze and Super Silver haze, so all of them are up there. And then, um, so so that would be one of the ones that I would reach for if it was in in the tin. Um, what was the second part of the question? Uh, What's a creation you're fond of that was made by someone else? Oh well, I mean Neville. I mean, uh, you know, I had I had the the best guy to be uh, a sort of mentor, and I suppose the Doctor Kevorkian would be. It's uh, I've, I've got it in seed, but I don't have it uh, in a living plant. But I, I um. It was another one of Super Silver Haze, Mango Haze, and Dr. Gavorkian were all in the the work that we were doing together, separately together, uh, and just bouncing off each other's idea. And I always loved that strain. It was just so different, aromatic, and it's like Neville's Haze and Super Silver Haze and Mango Haze together. It was kind of uh, it was it was an amazing, inspiring piece of work that one. And fortunately. We'll have to recreate it. Uh, it'll take quite some searching. But, I mean, I remember driving back with uh, – we had to move a room really quickly um, and it was uh, full of Dr. Gavorkian. Neville cut it down. Dad, my father was with me and we were in a small panda or something. We drove down to his place, loaded up the car with green plants. I mean, they were huge. They were six-foot plants and it stunk. I mean, I took the whole room in this small panda – me and my father, who is not into that world at all, drove like 150 k's back to hang it up in our thing. And I think the effect of the smell got us so high, and it was just such a bonding experience to have with my my late father. It was it was great. <laughs> By the end of it, he loved the smell. So it just shows you, you know, you can change. Uh, he was always very supportive anyway, and, and was a good friend of Howard's. So it was. It was the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, sort of thing. Oh, what a what a beautiful story! I love it. And uh, out of curiosity, just because I'm I'm actually not familiar with the Doctor Gavorkian strain, is that from the same um, genetics that the mango haze and the Neville's haze came from? Yeah, they were very very uh, much. Um, it was just a different uh, a different uh, sister selected, and then bred uh, and then flowered on. So at, at one stage we were doing, we were going through all of the, I think we went through, I think Neville must have gone through a thousand seeds to find Super Silver Haze. Mango Haze, uh, we went through hundreds. And Dr. Kavolkin was also one of the ones that we found, well, one of the ones that Neville had found along the way and then we started to flower it and, it was just, it was a, it was not an indoor plant, but we did an indoor room, and it was just everybody loved it. I mean, it went out pretty quickly. So, <laughs> just some of those, we we had uh, a lot of access to uh, many of those kind of strains that no longer exist. And um, you know, in retrospect, they 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 taught you something to make sure that you kept backups and learn how to do mothers and cloning and, and then you would flower them out and then you flower them two or three times to make sure that they were exactly what you think they were and they were usually so yeah i mean it was it was definitely from the same line same time and same same sort of haze haze combination with northern lights and skunk and they were th th those combinations still to me they're building blocks to this day of you know Sounds incredibly special. We, I guess we can only hope to try it ourselves one day. So we've spoken about some really stellar examples. I want to know, on the other end of the spectrum, what's something that really caught on with the masses, but when you tried it, never really spoke to you? I suppose um, there's been a lot of those strains that other companies uh, felt really good about and um, they didn't really rock my world. And... Um, um i'm i'm good friends with most of them i don't really want to say that um well like just now with all of these uh, um all of these these things these cookies and i'm not a really big fan for all of that i mean it doesn't really like you said mentioned earlier that it's got a limited effect and and i i do eventually smoke for effect and and these don't really rock my world either you know and and I, as much as they're wonderful to smell and they're lovely to look at and they're very dense and everything's good about three out of five traits but you know i think 
that hasn't really impressed me uh, overly. But I mean, I, 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 listen, if I didn't have anything, I'd be very happy to be given a butt. You know what I mean? So it's not like I, I'm, I'm humble always when it comes to that, and there's no best one. On a certain day, I'll probably find that the things that I'm, you know, sort of criticizing might really turn me on if I'm in the mood. So it's very difficult. It's a very difficult question, I'm afraid. No, no, that's a that's a good answer, and I can completely agree. Some days things speak to you more than others. So, the next question is: I'm going to drop you on a desert island. What three things are you going to take? It could be a cutting or a pack of seeds if you want to do some breeding. What are you in for? Well, I mean, if I had a, that, I would take a pure a pure haze and a pure indica and a pure skunk, and I, I think I could make pretty much the the rest of the my plant my world um, flower. Let's say. But if I just had to pick a, a, a seed seeds to take, um, I, I I would definitely um, I would I'm, I'm one of these guys that have always had a, a pure uh, extremes. So the the mother and the father would be very pure, and then I can make pretty much everything in the middle. And so I've always kind of thought that way. Um, same with the CBD crew, we came about by that. But I suppose I would have to take mango haze. I would have to take nautil or critical mass would, would be because critical mass has changed. The, I mean, it changed a lot of people and they're all still using it. But nautil, which was super skunk, uh, Afghan skunk, um, it's the one that Howard changed the name. He wanted to name one after his book. In, in the book, he refers to the code name of marijuana was nautil. So he wanted that to be... Uh, go down in history so I, that, that's a very good strain um and that was a uh, very fast flowering so i wouldn't have to wait too long to be smoking if i was on a desert island i could get one and then the other one a bit later and i then mix it up i would probably um master kush has always been an absolute favorite as i said it was a very creative effect and i suppose if you can blend that with, with some of the haze things and then some of the the skunk and Afghan kind of facets, you'd have um, enough to live happily ever after on this little desert island. Hopefully it was big enough to, to do a couple of crops a year. <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> I, I could I'd make some seeds and have my protein. So I, I, I think I could survive there. Yeah. yeah. No, I love it. I love it. There's Conveniently, there's a lifetime supply of uh, fertilizer there for you. So it all works out. <laughs> Uh, so, final question for our chat today. If you had to restart Mr. Nice with just one pack of your own stock, what pack would you use? Afghan Haze. Beautiful. What draws you to it? Well, it's the building block of nearly every kind of 50-50, uh, uh, a Haze and, and Sativa. Um, I still find it to be one of the most reliable strains in our camp along with ash, um, Afghan haze by Afghan skunk, or, um, you know. So those ones I can uh, I can get, if you look towards the extreme sides, the hay side I could definitely find something towards like Neville haze. And on the other side I could definitely find some very fast-flowering, Afghani, fruity, strong narcotic things. So, you know, Afghan haze is a very big building block for me. And I, I think uh, we make it available to on the auctions on our website for many members, and 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 I think a lot of people would agree with that as well. Yeah, no, I've I've tried a few samples of uh, the Angel Haze and a few other crosses it's used in, and it's uh, gorgeous stuff. So. I think that just about brings us to the end of it for this one. We, we'd love to get you back on, but as always, any comments or shout-outs you'd like to make? No, just uh, um, you, you're predominantly, um, I suppose you have a lot of English-speaking Australian uh, audience. So I just, I mean, I'm hoping that uh, we're starting to export from Switzerland um, uh, our flowers to uh, to Australian medical um, um, uh, company. Uh, probably... In January, we, we get all the permissions, and, and I will have, uh, I think, Super Silver Haze, Critical Mass, the original shit, and uh, Pink Lemonade, one of the ones I've been playing with a little bit. Those four will soon be available as flower, dried flowers from um, um, Fitoka. It's a company that we work with in Melbourne, 
um, e exclusively, and um, I, 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 they've they've been really good um, in the sense that we've been working with them already on CBD. But I'd like to uh, give a shout out for the people in Australia who have been asking me where eventually can we try some of those flowers. Um, that would be the the thing. Um, hopefully, uh, everything will be checked by me before it leaves Switzerland for sure. So I can guarantee you that uh, there will be good representation and originals uh, from the original plants. But I'd just like to say thank you to yourself uh, for spending the time. I, I don't normally do these things, as I said, but uh, I kind of I realise how important it is for people to um, learn some historic references as well and, and kind of get an understanding from someone who was there. And, and, you know, you don't have to believe everything I say, but... That was the account according to me, and and so I, I hope you, you do well with your podcasts as well. Oh, that, that's very kind of you, and again, we're incredibly appreciative of your time as always. So a massive thank you to one of the absolute titans in the cannabis scene, one of the last remaining pillars of modern genetics. A huge shout-out to Shanti Barber of Mr. Nice. Thank you very much. So there you have it, friends. What did you think? Massive thank you for Shanti Barber taking the time to come chat with us today. We are definitely going to have to get him back on for a part two. And a massive shout out to you guys for getting to the end. We appreciate you so much. Just like we appreciate our incredible sponsors. If you want to help support the show, support our sponsors. CT now, number one seed bank in the industry. You know them, you love them. All the best breeders, the hottest drops. Guarantee on satisfaction, not just germination. Why delay, guys? I promise you will be stoked if you get some seeds from them. They only stock the best in the game. Likewise, a massive shout out to our friends at Pulse Sensors, all the best and latest sensors in the game, including their new Pulse Hub, which integrates all of their units together to ensure that your operation is on point, producing bigger yields, better terps, higher potency. Whether you're running a single tent, a single room, or a multi-state operation, Pulse are here to help you guys. Get serious, get a Pulse. Further shout out to Copa, the number one leaders in sustainable biocontrol solutions for pests and disease. If you're battling spider mites, please check out the Spidex Vital sachets. I can't tell you how annoying it is to have to spread carrier material in your garden just to get the predators out. These new sachets circumvent that. Just hang the sachets in your crop, let the personalist walk out, do the work for you. Trust me guys, you won't look back. If you give it one go, you will see the quality, you will be converted. A massive shout out to Copert. We appreciate your support so much. These guys are industry leaders. Check them out. Huge shout out to our friends at Organics Alive, number one for powdered organic fertilizers. If you're thinking about giving organics a go, get on board. Their products make it so easy. Whether you're in veg, transition, or bloom, they've got products that make it easy to dip your toes in the water. Likewise, if you're a seasoned veteran of organics, I promise their products will help take your next crop to a whole new level. Massive shout out to Organics Alive. They have some of the best products on the market. Really fast release because they're small particle size. You will not go wrong with Organics Alive. Hit them up. Massive shout out and thank you. Finally, a big shout out to our friends at Dynavap. Just a week or two ago, they came out with some new models, the Titanium M series in two different colors. You can get yourself the Nebulum or the Quantium. I've been rocking the Nebulum. I love it, guys. Please give it a go. If you've ever tried a vape and felt like it didn't hit the way you were looking for it, these ones will. Truly a game changer based out of the US, owned in the US. Dynavap, truly one of the best vape companies on the market. I really, really love their products and we are super appreciative of their support. Massive shout out to Dynavap. Last but not least, massive shout out to the Patreon gang. Thank you so much for your support. If you want to help ensure the show continues to happen, please consider checking out patreon.com forward slash the podcast you will get early access to upcoming episodes unheard exclusive interviews and you go in the running to win a whole range of swag each month we give away genetics cannabis artwork a whole range of awesome products all while ensuring the show continues to happen again a massive shout out to the patreon gang we love you so 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 much thank you thank you thank you and that just about does it for this one I'll see you for the next one. See you.